From the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, this is Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffers. Hi, I'm Robert Jeffers, and welcome again to Pathway to Victory. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, if you have faith as tiny as that of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So how do we develop the kind of faith that allows us to overcome major obstacles that block our path to God's blessings? Well, today I'm beginning a brand new series called Invincible. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to show you how to conquer the mountains that separate you from the blessed life. My message is titled, Moving from Doubt to Faith, in our series, Invincible, here on Pathway to Victory. Rising 29,029 feet in the air, Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. It's actually a part of a range of mountains known as the rooftop of the world. For years, people tried to conquer Everest with no luck, but on May 23rd, 1953, mountaineers Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay became the first explorers to scale Everest. Interestingly, it wasn't Edmund Hillary's first attempt. Two years earlier, he had tried to reach the summit and he failed. And reportedly after his failure, he stood at the base of that mountain, shook his fist at it and said, I will return and conquer you because as a mountain, you can't grow, but as a human being, I can. And he returned two years later and he conquered that mountain. Now, the fact is you and I will probably never climb a mountain or at least not one like Mount Everest. But you and I face different kinds of mountains in our lives. Challenges that seem impossible. In fact, the Bible uses the imagery of a mountain to talk about an impossible situation. Today, we're beginning a brand new series called Invincible, conquering the mountains that separate you from the blessed life. And over these weeks, we're going to look at God's word and see what the Bible says about the mountains you and I face. You may be facing right now a mountain called discouragement. Maybe you are facing a mountain called addiction. Maybe right now you're facing the mountain of loneliness. The Bible says that with God's help and your obedience, you can be invincible. And that's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verses 22 and 23, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. And <laughs> what in the world did Jesus mean? He wasn't saying you can literally pick up a mountain and move it, but he said you can conquer it. In the same way, that challenge you're facing right now that you seem to deal with over and over again, God's not saying that challenge is ever going to disappear completely. But again, with your obedience and God's help, you can conquer that obstacle. And that's what we're going to talk about in this series. But notice the condition Jesus says. He says, this promise is available to those who do not doubt in their heart. Nothing will prevent your conquering mountains in your life any more than doubt. And so today, as we begin this series, we're going to begin with the first mountain that we all face from time to time, the mountain of doubt, questions that we have. And we're going to discover how to move from doubt to faith so that we can truly be invincible. Now, the truth is, whether we're willing to admit it or not, all of us have doubts from time to time. Doubts about life, doubts about God, doubts about the promises of God's word. If it makes you feel better, so have some of God's choicest servants in the Bible. They had to deal with doubt. Uh, Moses doubted that he was capable of delivering the Israelites from uh, Pharaoh. Uh, David doubted that he was going to be able to escape from King Saul. 
Uh, you look at Jeremiah. He had doubts about his call as a prophet. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, came to a crisis in which he doubted whether or not Jesus was really the Messiah. And it doesn't stop there. Throughout church history, great men and women of faith have had doubts. Now, there's a difference between doubt and unbelief, as we're going to see, all the difference in the world. Uh, doubt can be very natural. Part of the reason we doubt sometimes is just because it's hard doing business with an infinite God. There's such a difference between God and us. And that's why God said to Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And that's why we, when we doubt, running to God, asking for answers in and of itself is an act of faith. The fact that we would go to God when we have doubts shows that we believe. What I'm saying to you is doubt and faith can actually coexist with one another. Doubt and faith and unbelief cannot coexist. There's a difference between honest doubt and unbelief. Somebody has said it this way, doubters look for reasons to believe. Unbelievers look for reasons not to believe. Doubters ask questions. Unbelievers refuse answers. God accepts doubters. He rejects unbelievers. Doubt is universal. It's natural. Why do we doubt? Why do we doubt God? Frederick Buechner, the Christian writer, said, I love this, he said, doubts are like ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. <laughs> well, here are some of the reasons we have ants in our pants of faith sometimes. First of all, unlived truth can be a cause for doubt in your life. I'll never forget the warning of a seminary professor 40 years ago, he said, men, never forget this. Nothing will cause you more doubt than trafficking in unlived truth. What he was saying was, if you as a pastor are up preaching God's word week after week, but in your own heart there is secret sin, it's going to cause you to doubt. By the way, that's not just a warning for preachers. It's a warning for every Christian. When you are living disobediently, to the truth you say you believe. It's going to cause great doubt in your life. Let me tell you what I've discovered as a pastor. It is impossible for a Christian to hold on to belief in God and hold on to his disobedience to God for any long period of time. Maybe for a short period, but over the long term, you can't hold on to both God and disobedience. You'll either give up your disobedience or you'll let go of your belief in God. You can't hold on to both of them. Unlived truth can be a cause of great doubt. Secondly, unexamined faith. We have this little adage that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. We think, oh, isn't that great faith? Not really. Because that faith, that kind of faith is usually shipwreck eventually when it comes upon the rocks of contradictions. Whenever uh, somebody uh, hears a, a sermon that maybe causes him to doubt God's word or reads an article or listens to an interview, eventually somebody's going to face some kind of challenge to their faith. And if they don't understand why they believe what they do, it's going to cause great doubt. We need to understand not only what we believe, but why we believe it. Second, thirdly, unanswered prayer can be a cause of doubt. We pour out our hearts to God and heaven is silent. We wonder, why doesn't God hear my plea? Does he not care about me? Is he not really there? By the way, Daniel in the Old Testament dealt with that problem of unanswered prayer. He was distressed about Israel's exile in Babylon and he wanted to know the future. He asked God for some reassurance in Daniel 10, and the heavens were silent. And finally, after 21 days, Micah, the archangel, um, 
uh, appeared, Michael the archangel, and he said, I'm sorry I'm late, but I got held up. There was a demonic war going on in heaven, and that's why I'm delayed in my answer. Now, I'm not sure how many times that happens, if that's a common reason for unanswered prayer, but it was the reason for Daniel. The Bible says sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers because of our own sin. In Isaiah 59, 2, remember God said through the prophet, your wrongdoings have caused a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so he does not hear. If you harbor sin in your life, don't expect God to answer your prayers. Thirdly, the Bible says sometimes idolatry can keep God from answering our prayers. If we love, if we uh, put ahead God, uh, any other person or any other thing above God in our life, uh, that's idolatry to love anyone or anything more than we love God. And it can hinder our prayers. In Ezekiel 14, 3, God said, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts, and they have put in front of their faces the stumbling block of their wrongdoing. Should I let myself be consulted by them at all? God said, should I listen to people who love other things or love other people more than I do? The Bible said, finally, many times the answer to unanswered prayer is, I don't know. As God said through Isaiah, my ways are not your ways. A fourth cause of doubt sometimes, and perhaps the most basic reason for most people is what they feel like is undeserved suffering in their life. Nothing has caused more people to give up their faith in God than what they feel is undeserved suffering. You've heard the old question, why do bad things happen to good people? One theologian said, oh, well, that's easy. There are no good people. And theologically, that's true. I mean, we're all sinners, but that doesn't keep us from asking the question. It bothers us, not only that bad things happen, but that there doesn't seem to be any difference between what happens to Christians and what happens to non-Christians. Everybody seems to go through the same problems, regardless of their faith or lack of faith. Jesus said it rains on the just and the unjust. We're going to talk about three practical ways to handle your doubts. But before we do that, we're going to look at a case study in doubt from the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 11. We're going to look at the champion doubter of all time. Do you know who he is? His name is Thomas. He was one of the apostles. We don't talk a lot about Thomas, perhaps because of all of the doubts he had. But I like Thomas. I really do, because Thomas was the kind of guy that would ask the question that everybody else was thinking privately. I mean, he, he actually said what everybody else was thinking in a room, and God honored that. He, honest his, he honored his sincere questioning. And turn to John chapter 11, and we're going to look at three areas of doubt that Thomas had and how they correspond to the kind of doubts we have. First of all, doubts about life itself. Doubts about life itself. I'm talking about doubts about what's happening to you and whether God is capable of leading you through the challenge of this life. The events leading up to the resurrection of Lazarus were quite interesting. Lazarus was one of Jesus' best friends along with his sisters Mary and Martha. And when um, Jesus got word that Lazarus was sick. The disciples thought, well, we'll go to heal him. Uh, but Jesus had a different idea. He waited a little bit longer so he could wait until Lazarus had died and he could perform that great resurrection. But it's interesting that when uh, Jesus finally said, let's go, in verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there to get again? They were going to go to Bethany, just two miles away from Jerusalem. They said, aren't you forgetting what the leaders tried to do? They just tried to kill you. Are you going to go back and risk your life? And what they weren't saying is, are you going to go back and risk our life as well? Why are you doing that? Thomas was one of those disciples. 
And yet I love his reply in verse 16. Finally, therefore, Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us also go said, so that we might die with him. Thomas had a serious question about whether this was a wise thing to do, but notice how he expressed his faith. We're going to go, even if it means dying with you. Sometimes we have doubts about life. Some of our doubts are about the future, about eternity. The next time we see John in the Gospel of John, it's in John chapter 14. The disciples were with Jesus in the upper room the night before he was crucified. Jesus was explaining about the sacrifice he was about to make for them. But he gave them these words of assurance in John 14, 1. This was all in the upper room. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And Thomas, one of the apostles, raised his hand and said, Jesus, hey, Jesus, we don't have a clue where you're going. How in the world do you expect us to know the way to where you're going? That's what he said in verse 5. And Jesus responded to him, verse 6, and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Think about it. Without Thomas's doubt, we never would have gotten that tremendous answer. <laughs> that reminds us there is something on the other side of the grave. That place called heaven. It's all natural for us to doubt that. Again, we've never seen it before. We're stuck in this life. It's natural to question about eternity, but Jesus says there is a heaven, and he showed us the way to get there through faith in his death for our sins. Thirdly, Thomas illustrates doubts about God himself. Doubts about God, and this is the foundational doubt we have to wrestle with. Is Jesus really who he said he was? Remember, after the crucifixion that next day on Friday, what did the disciples do? They holed up in a secret hiding place, cowering in fear that they too would be arrested and crucified like Jesus had been. And then on that Sunday evening after the resurrection, Jesus miraculously appeared in front of those disciples. He said, I'm here. See the scars in my hands. Look at the scars in my side and my feet. They were astonished at what they saw. But then John sounds this ominous note in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. Where was he? He had allowed his disbelief, his disenchantment with Jesus to cause him to separate from the disciples. When the disciples saw Jesus crucified, their dreams evaporated. They said, he's just another man. But Thomas allowed his doubts to become disbelief, and he separated himself from the rest of the apostles. And so verse 25 says that apparently they went out and found Thomas, and they said to him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, here's a principle I want you to write down. It's not on your outline. Write this down. Distance from others is dangerous for doubters. Distance from others is dangerous for doubters. Lone rangers are easily ambushed. Thomas made a key mistake here. By separating from the other believers, going out by himself, his doubt was turning into unbelief. Questions, if we're not careful, can become seeds of doubt, and seeds of doubt can grow into unbelief. And unbelief is like a mushroom it grows best in the darkness. Now listen to me. 
When you have times of doubt in your life about your Christian faith, Satan will do everything he can to convince you you need to separate from the church. You need to separate from other Christians. You need to work things out on your own before you come back and believe no. If you do that, you become spiritual roadkill. No, there is strength in numbers. Don't make the mistake of distancing yourself, distancing yourself from others when you doubt. How do you move from doubt to faith? How can you make sure that one day you hear similar words, well done, good and faithful servant? Let me share with you three practical principles for moving from doubt to faith. Number one, don't deny your doubts. Acknowledge them. Don't deny your doubts. Acknowledge them. The reason we're fearful of acknowledging our doubts is we've got this secret fear that our doubts are bigger than God's answers. We think our questions are too great for God's answers. Don't worry about that. God is big enough to handle your questions. Philosophies, they come and go. In the early part of the 19th century, the German philosopher Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, said, God is dead. That was revolutionary. God is dead. Today, God says, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> I mean, philosophies come and go, but God's word stands forever. Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I remember talking to a Christian. She was crying. She had all kind of doubts. She said, I'm not even sure I believe in God anymore. I said, that's okay. That's okay. Because even when you don't believe in God, he still believes in you. Don't worry about denying your doubts. Go ahead and acknowledge them. Your questions are no match for God's answers. Secondly, don't dread your doubts. Analyze them. Again, we dread doubts because we fear that our doubts will destroy our faith. No, go ahead and analyze them. Why, why are you doubting? Is it something you read? Some question you have about the faith? Is it because of an unanswered prayer or a suffering you're experiencing? Is it because of perhaps disobedience in your life, analyze your doubts. Thirdly, don't disguise your doubts, articulate them. Don't disguise your doubts, articulate them. Thomas was willing to verbalize exactly why he was doubting and what he needed. You need to do that too. Remember, doubt grows in the darkness. Doubt grows in the darkness. You know, I read somewhere that every Christian needs to have three people in his life, a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. In other words, we need a Paul, somebody who can mentor us, a mature Christian that we can look to for guidance. We all need a Timothy, somebody to disciple, somebody whose life we are pouring into. But we all thirdly need a Barnabas. Remember, he was the son of encouragement in Acts 5 who was always encouraging people. Now, the key is when you go through a time of doubt, you've got to know which one to go to. Don't go to somebody you're trying to disciple, somebody who's younger in the faith than you are. You're going to destroy them if you do that. But there needs to be a mature Christian you can go to. And you'll find that when you voice your doubt to them, they'll say, you know what? I've been through the same thing. Or I've had the same question, and here's how I resolved it in my life. Make sure you have somebody you can go to. And remember, above all people, go to God with your questions. I came across the simple formula for dealing with doubt that came from Mark Littleton. He said, turn your doubts into questions. Then turn your questions into prayers. And turn your prayers to God. That's the way for dealing with doubts. Don't disguise your doubts, articulate them. And when we turn our doubts into prayers and turn them to God, he will encourage you just like he did, Thomas, by saying, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Apparently, Thomas held on to those words for the rest of his life. 
Do not be unbelieving, but believing. How do I know that? Well, church tradition tells us that after the resurrection, Thomas went to India where he started churches there. He then went to China where he started the Christian church in Peking. He came back to India and nurtured those new believers in Christ. One day when he was an old man, he was in a cave praying to God. And a group of Hindu priests attacked him, fearful that Christianity was going to overshadow Hinduism. And one of those Hindu priests uh, thrust a spear into the side of Thomas, thinking they had killed him. But they hadn't. When they left, Thomas was able to crawl to a nearby church staff, a chapel. He wrapped his arms around the base of a stone cross. He looked up at that cross and said, Thank you, God, for your mercies in my life. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. Those are not the words of a doubter. There are words of somebody who finally conquered the mountain of doubt. And they can be your final words as well. If you learn the secret of moving from doubt to faith. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, all of us harbor secret doubts from time to time. Gratefully, we're not alone. Even Thomas, a disciple who walked side by side with Jesus, doubted his faith. And if doubt is at the forefront of your mind today, I hope you'll follow this biblical roadmap for moving from doubt to faith. Well, throughout the scriptures, we are told not to worry but that's easier said than done, isn't it? So how can we overcome the crippling effects of anxiety? Stay tuned for a preview of what's coming up next on Pathway to Victory. What I mean by that is whenever we build our life around the temporal instead of the eternal, we're going to be fearful of losing what we prize the most. For example, if we've built our life around money, instinctively we know that can be taken from us and so we work and work and work and accumulate more and more and more, hoard more and more, but we know deep down we can't protect ourselves from loss. Join us next time for the message, Moving from Anxiety to Peace, here on Pathway to Victory.